Good morning, Draper Campus. Good morning. Good morning. Pleasure to be here with you. Pastor Jody isn't feeling well, so I got called out of the dugout to come help and, <laughs> and uh, be with you guys this morning. Uh, but a pleasure to be here. I, I found it kind of fitting, actually. I got to start the series, and now Siri and I get to end the series. So God had his way in the end, I guess, right? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, if you if, shoot Jody a lot of messages today, let her know you love her. I'm sure she'll love her phone blowing up from all of you guys. <laughs> yeah, that was a joke, by the way. Um, some, of, <laughs> some of you got that. Um, but no, we'll, we'll be praying for her that she'll get better quickly and get back to us real soon. Amen? Amen. But I'm the, the pastor of our Utah County campus. If I don't know you, um, I want to get to know you. Um, there's a lot of new faces in here. It seems like every time I come up here, there's new faces, which is a huge blessing. I love it. I'm blessed to see Shaka in the front. I haven't seen him for 10 years. Uh, if any of you have doubts that I was an athlete, you can ask him. We ran track together at a SUU. He's a, he's a stud. But, um, but yeah, I'm also joined with, with Siri here, who is one of our teachers here at the, uh, at, at the adventure and, and someone who really embodies what it means to be a shepherd. In a lot of ways, if you ever get a chance to talk with Siri and, and learn from her, I know I have over the years, she's got a lot of great things to teach. And, and basically, my job today is to let her just go off with what the Lord's going to do. And if she clams up, I'll jump in, basically. Okay? Um, but no, she's going she's gonna to do amazing. It's an amazing message. We shared it last night down with our Utah County campus and, and then with first service. So third time's a charm, right? Yeah. We sh- this should be the, a fine-tuned machine at this point. <laughs> as far as what the Lord wants to do. But um, Siri, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit for those who don't know you? Well, I was just thinking, as you said, that last set, best set. If you do anything <laughs> in the gym, that's kind of the saying. So hopefully this is our best set. But um, I'm Siri Mancher, for those of you who don't know me. And um, we've been, come, my husband and I have been part of the adventure for, I think now 14 years. So it's, we've been here a while and um, you guys are definitely our family and um my husband and I have been married 31 years this summer, so we joke and say we married each other young and raised each other. So <laughs> at least you did to Brian, right? Yes, okay. yeah, I, yeah. There's some fun <laughs> stories about that, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's been good, but it's been hard. As many of you who have been married know, it is not an easy thing because it requires dying to self a lot, right? Um, in order to love that other person sacrificially. Um, but we have two amazing sons and, um, our younger son is getting married in July and both girls who my older son is married and both of our sweet daughter in loves are more than I ever asked or imagined and prayed for them. So I baptized one of them so I can vouch for at least one of them. So (laughs) No, yeah, they are amazing. So parents, don't give up praying and just know that your prayers are heard, heard and the Lord has his way of bringing it about. So, um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything no, else that's great. Thanks for Thanks for me. joining us. Yeah. Excited to dive into to the story. You know, the story we're going to look at today is one that I think often gets overlooked in a lot of our Bible readings. It's not a big flashy uh, story like we read about in others. And I think a lot of times if you were reading the gospel of Luke, you, you'd probably just read right through it, wouldn't think much of it, and just go on to the next story. But as Siri and I were discussing it this week, and we were like, wow, there's there's a lot of significance in this. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of kind of how the Old Testament points into the New Testament, who Jesus is. And and so we're excited to dive into that. But Siri, why don't you pray for us for, okay. before we dive into the, the reading and then We'll get into context and all that. Excellent. Father, thank you for how good you are and your faithfulness, as that last song said. And as Ira pointed out, God, I, I'm overwhelmed over and over and over again at your faithfulness. A lot of times things don't look the way I think they should, but you still are faithful and you are good and your mercies are new every morning and your compassions never fail. And Lord, I just pray that today you be magnified for us, that we see you in a better, deeper um, way than we have before, and that we leave this place changed and impacted by you, Jesus, by who you are, by what you did in this story, and what you do in our lives. Thank you for... um, Thank you for just being you and being who you are. 
just be glorified and let your words be what's come out of our mouths today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So kind of give us an intro right. today. So we're going to be in Luke 7, 11 through 17. And if you're not familiar, this is the story where Jesus raises the widow of Nain's son. And the background here and um, is just such a beautiful background. So Nain is about three or four miles from the city of Shunem which Kelly had pointed out in one of our earlier services that Shunem was just kind of over the mountain, over the hill from Nain. And I bring that up because in Shunem, 800 years before Jesus's time was the time of Elisha. How many of you know the prophet Elisha in the Old Testament? So Elisha went around ministering to Israel and and Shunem was a place he would stop to rest. There was a couple there, a Shunemite woman who just knew he was a man of God. And so she told her husband, like, we need, we need to make a room for him so he can rest here when he passes through. And so they cared for Elisha in this way. And at the end of his journey in, he, um, he says to the woman, what can I do to, for you to thank you? And the woman doesn't really have any real responses, but Elisha's servant says to Elisha, hey, she is without a son and her husband is old. So this might not mean much to us in our time, but in that time and in Jesus's time, a woman's value was not much. And if she lost her husband and she had no son to care for her, she was destitute. So she was basically, she was at the same eco level uh, as the prostitutes, the beggars and the cri cripples. So, what Elisha's servant is saying here is like, let's take care of her for the rest of her life, basically, right? So Elisha says, done. In a year, you're going to have a son. And sure enough, she has a son a year later. The, a few years later past that, her son gets sick and ends up dying in her lap is what the Bible tells us. She saddles a donkey right away. She doesn't take she doesn't take time to grieve nothing. She lays her son on Elisha's bed in the room they had made for Elisha, gets on a donkey and races to Mount Carmel where Elisha was, which was about 20 miles away. She gets to Elisha, she tells him and she really you basically is saying to Elisha like, "You you told me that I have a son and now he's dead." You know, and so Elisha sends his servant uh, with his staff and says, go lay the staff on the corpse. Well, I don't know if y'all know the Mosaic law, but some scholars believe that Elisha sent his servant ahead with the staff because if you are touch a corpse or even in the same room as a corpse, you're unclean for seven days and you have to do this ceremonial cleaning, cleansing during that time. So some scholars believe that's why Elisha sends his servant and his staff first. Well, the servant comes back and says, there's no life in the boy. And so the Shunammite woman, you know, begs Elisha and they head back to Shunem to this boy. And Elisha goes in and we'll kind of get into what his procedure is here in a little bit. Um, but he raises the son for this woman. Well, this is three to four miles away from Nain. So to me, and I think to Kelly, there is no coincidence that Jesus, his first miracle raising someone from the dead is there in Nain. I believe that he's bringing yep. fulfillment of the prophecies and of the prophets. So um, that is where we are. So let me start yeah. reading Luke 7, 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples in the village of Nain, and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the bearers stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Then the boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. 
Great fear swept the crowd and they praised God saying, a mighty prophet has risen among us and God has visited his people today. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. Beautiful. Well, and I love to just add to the little bit, the setting is everything in a story, right? The context and setting, it means a lot. And so, you know, the, the fact that all this is going down in Nain, Shunem, and it's, it's all very, it resonates with the, the audience, right? And, and I'm hoping that the same kind of contextual setting resonates with us a little bit, especially if you're one who is struggling with your value. If you're, if you're looking and then the world is saying basically you have no value due to something that's happened to you or the things that you've done, whatever that may be, this is a story for you. Okay? This is a story that can encourage you, that can give you some a reality of who Jesus is and what he thinks about you. Okay? Because this is exactly what's, what's happening in this story. So if you're really struggling with that in particular, this is a great one to, to kind of keep bookmarked, to go back and revisit because this is who Jesus goes to, right? This is where Jesus goes to, is to those who are looking at, at, at themselves or the way the world looks at them and going, what am I offering? What value do I have, right? And this is exactly who the Lord is after. This is exactly who Jesus is coming after in this story, who he comes after today. So be encouraged by that, because the setting in this is, this is what sets the stage. Yeah, yeah. so good. So, Something you see right away is Jesus's compassion, right, in this story. I mean, it's hard to miss it. But I think, like Kelly said, for years I read through this, the passage, because right before this is the centurion's um, faith and Jesus healing his servant. When I don't know if y'all are familiar with that, where the centurion basically says, hey, if you, you know, I give orders to my men and they do what I say, I don't have to go. So if you just say the word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus says, I have not seen such great faith in Israel, in all of Israel, right? So Jesus just speaks the word and his, the centurion's servant is healed. And so here we go into Nain and here to this widow and, and, Jesus notices her like he's coming in. They're going out great crowds on either side. And yet she's doing nothing to gain his attention. In fact, when he tells her, do not cry, that word cry there is wailing. She was wailing. She was in deep grief. She probably did not even notice Jesus and his crowd. She was grieving the loss of her son. And, and Jesus, it says, moved with deep compassion. And that word in the Greek there for compassion is he's moved to his bowels. Now we would say moved to the core. We're touched to the core of our being. So something about her, he notices and he's moved to the core of his being for her. And he holds out and he goes over to her and tells her, don't cry. Now, I, I kind of think I was sharing with first service, like, I don't know about you guys, but if I'm in deep grief and somebody comes over and tells me not to cry, I'm going to probably not handle that too well. <laughs> <laughs> I might want to smack them or something. But, you know, the truth is, I really believe because he was so moved with compassion that she saw that in him, whether he had tears in his eyes, whether, but she saw the compassion in his face. She saw it and he notices us in our, our wounds, our struggles, our pain. He notices us. We don't have to do something to gain his attention. He sees us. He is El Elroy, which he showed to Hagar in the Old Testament, the God who sees me. And he promised Hagar a nation because of her pain. He is the God who sees us, and he's the God who knows us. And that's, that's a really important reality that we need to remember, right? That in our hardest of moments, especially in that, that the temptation in those moments is to be, God, where are you? Right? Where were you when they were sick? Where were you when they were on their deathbed? Where were you now that they are gone? Right? That, is the, that, that is the initial reaction of a lot of how this goes. Right? But this is an important characteristic to remember is that Jesus was there, that he is there. Right? And, and that the important verse that comes to mind is that he is closest to the brokenhearted. 
right? That in our hardest of moments and the times where we can't reconcile what's going on around us. And like Siri said before in some of our prior conversations, you know, when you're just trying to get through the moment, mm-hmm. right? Where there's nothing makes sense anymore. The whole world has been turned upside down. All of the promise of the future, all of the things and dreams that you had mm-hmm. moving forward just removed. Mm-hmm. But God says, I'm there. That he goes to the very heart of who he is, is at the core of who he is as our God. And he goes, I'm with you. I'm here. I'm walking with you. It may not always feel that way. Sometimes we just want that reassuring feeling, like give me that overpowering peace, <laughs> right? So I don't have to feel this way anymore. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't always happen, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of times it's getting through the next moment with him, mm-hmm. knowing that he's there, realizing that he's there, and just being there in that moment with him. You know, this is an important thing. Again, something to, to really stamp into who we are as, mm-hmm. as followers of Christ is knowing how to relate to him in these moments of loss. Yeah. Knowing how to, to be there in the moments of loss with him are really important, right? And, mm-hmm. and you may even hear that little whisper of don't cry, mm-hmm. right? And, and just, you know, just recognizing that and realizing that is a really important step in kind of stepping forward moving forward and how we reconcile through this type of season. And I think it's in this, I think too, it's where our faith really takes root. I mean, it's easy to follow Jesus when everything's going well, right? But when everything starts falling apart, where were you? What are you doing? Are you still even here? Do I even know? I mean, these are my questions I asked him is, do I even know you? Are you even really who you say you are? You know, and, and it's in those hard moments where we really, that faith takes roots because if it doesn't, we're going to be blown over by the, by the grief and the sorrow and the pain, right? So that is where the rubber meets the road, as they would say, right? Um, but I, I love this because I was feeling convicted as I did this story because the last couple of years I've been looking at Jesus and the gospels just focused at him. I just want to see him. And I don't want us to miss Jesus today. I don't want us to just look at this story and go, ooh, this is what I can apply to my life, which is great. But we need to see Jesus. That's where our change comes from. When we see his face, when we experience who he is, real change happens inside of us. And so I, I was feeling convicted because I've just been, I've been so in love with Jesus this whole couple of years, just looking at him, but he convicted, the Lord convicted me in this because he brought to me John 14, nine, that Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the father. And what I felt convicted about is I have not loved the father as deeply as I've loved Jesus the last couple of years. But because Jesus is just the example, the father exemplified, right? That should go hand in hand. And so I'm repenting in front of all of you and, and just saying, Lord, that's not going to be anymore. I'm going to love the father as deeply as I love Jesus. So um, anything you want to add? No, that's, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I, we're seeing the very full character of who God is, yes. right? As our Father, mm-hmm. as a Savior, all of it, right? And so um, I, I love that it just it captures that mm-hmm. in its entirety in this yeah. passage. And, and then even moving into 14, mm-hmm. going and kind of carrying on that compassion component. You know, he went up to the buyer, right? Mm-hmm. And you can imagine this massive group. You know, these two massive groups collide. One is wailing and one is now joining into the procession of the morning. And he walks up to that buyer. It's like a, a wagon looking thing. And, and they didn't put people in coffins. They, put, they wrapped them up in linen, right? So they're taking them off to probably a, a tomb outside of the village somewhere, a family tomb where, where he would have been. And so Jesus put, makes himself to, pushes himself to this, this wagon, this buyer, and, and he touches it. Right? And everything in that moment just halts, just stops. Right? So if, you know, everyone knew that Jesus was a, an important figure. He was a rabbi. And so for him to go up and touch this buyer is very significant. It would have been like, well, what did Jesus, he, he just touched something of, of death. Right? And everyone would have just kind of, it would have been an unreal moment for that procession to stop and go, did he just, he just touched death. Mm-hmm. 
right? And he has just made himself and clean in the minds of those people, right? So this is why Luke like highlights it. Like he didn't even just join the procession. He touched the buyer, everybody, mm-hmm. right? This is why we kind of read this and go, so what, <laughs> right? This is really important. He touches death itself mm-hmm. and everything just freezes. Mm-hmm. The bearers stop. You can imagine the morning stop. Everyone just kind of halts what's mm-hmm. going on and looks at what's happening in this moment. Any more you want to add yeah. to that? Well, I just, I love because, you know, everyone's looking at him as he's just become unclean. But Jesus doesn't ever become unclean, right? He makes the unclean clean and restored. In every story that we've gone through in this series, you see him restoring, healing, touching, cleaning, everything. The lep- I don't know that we ever covered the leper, but that's one of my favorite stories that he goes and that leper probably had not been touched in years and he touches him and he cleanses him. He's healed. Jesus cleaned those and healed and restored. And then he restores to the community. And I think about in this with also the biblical justice that he is displaying in all of his, all of the things we've learned about in him in this series. But even here with the widow, biblical justice is not the justice we think about. It is the honorable reaching down and grabbing hold of the shameful and lifting them to a place of honor. That is what we are supposed to be about, guys. Like, as believers, as followers of Jesus, we are supposed to reach to the shamed and lift them to places of honor, showing them the love of Christ. So I love that he, he's, everyone's shocked here because he's touching this thing that's unclean, but he is restoring and he is making clean. I, I love um, one of the teachers that I have listened to. He says, you know, Jesus is giving us a glimpse of creation restored. Jesus is giving us a glimpse of what it was supposed to be like and what it will be like when he returns, right? So in every single one of his miracles, we get a glimpse of what God's heart, the Father's heart is for us as his creation no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more sin, no more death, right? Every tear will be wiped. Right. Yeah. Right? You think about the don't cry even in Revelation 21. Yeah. 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 And I think even in the, my favorite portion, my favorite words he says um, in this, that Jesus says in this is, young man, I say to you, get up. Mm-hmm. Right? So he, he has just stopped death in its tracks, mm-hmm. literally, on the, on the buyer, <laughs> Right? And he then says to this, this young man, young man, get up. It is time to get up. And other, other passage, you'll say, get up, rise up. Right? He says that. He's, he says that to a little girl as well. He says, Talitha kum, rise up, little girl. Rise up, little one. He, there's this connotation of, of getting up and out of what death has, has in store for us. Right? We see that with Lazarus. We see this again here in this story. And And so I think that what the Lord really wants to tell us, this is what he was pouring into me this week while I was getting prepared for this, is that rise up out of what death has done, right? That we are not belonging to death any longer, right? That death will try to have its way in us every single day, whether that be through things that have happened to you, the trauma you've received, the the people you've lost, the anxieties, the stress, all the things that we have no control over even. Yeah. All of these things bring about a death to the consequence. Mm-hmm. But what God is saying is rise up out of this. Get up, little ones, mm-hmm. and stand in the new creation mm-hmm. that I have been making for you. Mm-hmm. Right? That he is restoring, not just for us to, to have a, a great place for eternity, but that we can then be the ones who also partaking in the restoring now. Mm-hmm. Isn't that a beautiful thing that we then get to then rise up out of our tombs and then walk this world every day being able to restore with God what he is doing? I mean, that's what he wants to do, right? That's what he's empowered us to do, to be able to be the ones who have risen, the ones who are rised up, not bonded to death any longer, but now looking to the hope of glory that is to come. 
And I'll tell you, that is just complete freedom from this world. Right? When this world has no chain against you, the death itself has no consequence against you. What else do you have to worry about? What else could there be that could hold you back from rising up and walking this world in the new created life that God has given you and spreading that message to the whole world around you? How many of you know that our world needs that? Our world needs to be restored. Our, 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 Lord, our, our world and our Lord needs His people to walk as though they are risen mm -hmm. and not that they are held up in bondage to death mm -hmm. any longer because mm -hmm. death will not have the last word. Amen. Yeah. Amen. The sting of death, even though we experience it every day, people we, we love will, will die, mm -hmm. but the sting doesn't have to be there. Mm -hmm. The tear can be wiped from our eyes mm -hmm. and we can walk in complete freedom knowing that we have the hope of glory to come through Christ. And Amen. that's why that line is just so mm -hmm. powerful to me. It's, mm -hmm. it's a continuation of what Jesus is doing. And the new creation is that what sin had stolen from you, I'm here to come back and take it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. I just have a good friend. I mean, I have a good friend who reminded me recently, she had shared the gospel with someone and that person had really dishonored her and it made her stop in her tracks a little bit and get hesitant to want to share the gospel with people. And, and then when her and I got together, it only la you know, she only was hesitant for a few days, but she's like, you know what, Siri, I just figured out that was a viper on my hand. I just shook that thing off and went about my business. And I don't know if y'all are familiar with that story, but in, in I think it's Acts, uh, Paul has been shipwrecked and uh, he's going to collect wood for fire and he gets bit by a viper and he just shakes it off and continues. And everyone's shocked because he doesn't die. And, but I just, it challenged me so much because I thought, how often do I stare at the viper and freak out? that I have a viper on my hand, you know, instead of just shaking it off and moving on and, and trusting that God is calling me to get up. He is not calling me to focus on that viper. He's not calling me to stay on that, in that wagon, on that buyer. And this young man, like he sat up and immediately began talking. You bet he probably was asking lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I would hope that he followed Jesus him and his mother the rest of the time of Jesus's ministry, right? So what has Jesus done for us? And I think we can get so focused on the things where the world has taken the breath out of us, has pushed us to the ground, has left us bloody and bruised. And we're staring at that stuff, but we forget what Jesus has done. And so I think it's so important for us to remember what he has done and who he is. And in this story, the compassion he enters, we don't need to ignore the pain. I'm not, please hear me. I'm not telling you ignore whatever traumas or pains you're going through because we have to walk through them and we have to process with the Lord. Mm -hmm. But just like this widow, Jesus enters it with us. He enters with us and he walks with us and then gets us to the place where he can say, get up. I tell you, get up, you know, mm -hmm. but it, he walks and then he, he commands us. His yeah. word is so powerful, right? Amen. And that, that just, and then speaking of a word, I mean, that just shows exactly who he is, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you think of this compare and contrast with Elisha, yes. right? Elisha you know, he goes, all right, I'll, I'll send my servant with his staff. Oh, that didn't work. All right, I guess I got to go myself. And he like lays on the body. His like eyes are on the corpse's eyes and his mouth on the corpse's mouth. You can imagine that body's been there for about three or four days. So it's probably not a great situation for Elisha, <laughs> right? But he's just like, I don't know what else to do. I'm literally like laying on this corpse trying to make it rise. So he gets off the body and then he gets on his knees and he's like, Lord, you got to do this. You, you gave this child to this woman and now he's dead. You have to bring him back. Like at this desperation where you don't see that with Jesus, do you? He walks in with full confidence, stops that buyer in his tracks and says, get up. 
that shows you just how much more powerful mm-hmm. Jesus is, even than one of the greatest heroes of the Old Testament, Elisha, mm-hmm. who was desperate and, and just, God, you've got to do this. Mm-hmm. We don't see that with Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. We see someone who has full power, full authority, mm-hmm. commanding of the God, mm-hmm. a word of God, mm-hmm. being able just to speak it, and it happens, mm-hmm. right? So he wasn't just a, a great prophet. Mm-hmm. He was Emmanuel, God himself in the flesh, doing what God has been doing, which is bringing sinners to life. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. He, we was, I think about when we did the triumphant entry um, week and they were proclaiming there's a great prophet among us, right? So here these people have seen Jesus do these things in these mighty ways, right? Mighty acts that were way beyond Elisha and Elijah. Mm -hmm. And they're still missing it, still missing it. And my challenge for us today is, are we missing Jesus? Are we, have we created a Jesus out of things we've heard, stories we've heard, but we haven't looked at the word. We haven't looked at the Bible and really studied Jesus for who he was, what he said, what he did. Are we creating a Jesus that makes us feel good? Now, Jesus is amazing and he will wait, he will wipe away the tears, but he will also give you a kind of what for if you need it. <laughs> so I I just think we don't want to miss Jesus as the Jews missed him. They had built their belief on who the Messiah would be from scriptures, but he didn't look anything like what they thought, right? So I think. Let's keep our eyes set. And, and I shared with first service last night at Utah County, I used the word glare at Jesus. <laughs> and afterwards, my wonderful husband's like, I don't think you wanted to use that word. <laughs> that was my picture was like a, you know, like and, a, and he's like, when I think of glare, I think of the cats staring at me because <laughs> I won't feed them. <laughs> and I was like, well, doesn't glare mean stare intensely? And he's like, so he looked it up and he's like, no, it's staring with anger or fiercely. <laughs> so don't glare job, at Brian. Jesus. <laughs> Don't glare at Jesus, but stare at him, stare at him. And I think of Peter, when he walked on the water, he was staring at Jesus. And as long as he stared at Jesus, he could do the impossible. And guys, we can do, we can overcome the things that have happened in our lives, not in our own willpower, not by our own strength, but by his. We can do nothing of our own accord, only by Jesus. And so let's stare at his face. And let's overcome and let's get up off of that buyer and let's see him for more than just a great prophet. Let's see him for the mighty savior he is and the Lord and the warrior. You know, Revelation says he's coming back and he's he's on a horse and he looks pretty fierce. So, Mm -hmm. you know, he's not just savior. He is Lord of all lords and king of all kings. And I just want you to know he still raises the dead. And I'm going to just share with you right now part of my story. And and death looks different to all of us, right? Like it doesn't mean like what we think of literal death, but there can be death of dreams. There can be death of hope. Um, so in my story, I'm going to start way back. So my husband and I couldn't have children. And so we adopted two amazing boys. And our older boy, he was just... Uh, he was full of life. Let me just say that that way. Um, he still is. <laughs> some of you know him and probably get that, get a glimpse of that every now and then. Full of life, keeping me on his toe, my toes. And first words were, what's that? And seriously, not mama and dada, what's that? And he would ask me, what's that? Until I gave him, I'd tell him that's a truck. And then he'd ask me, what's that? Until I said, that's a blue truck. And then it was until I gave him the make and the model. It's a Ford F-150 blue (laughs) truck. And then I had to find out the year that it was. So this was his mind. It was great. It was pastoring a kid like that. (laughs) I've never been tested in my Bible knowledge in my life. Like what color was Elisha's hair? Uh Yes. (laughs) It was, it was quite, it's quite exhausting at times, but also the Lord just kept saying, I made him this way. You need to glorify me in it, you know? And, and, um, so as a young boy, he definitely, 
had his strong will, but at five years old, trauma hit. And um, we didn't know this until he was 16. But And I asked him if I could share his story. And he told me, Mom, I share it with everyone. So you just go right ahead, you know. Um, but at uh, five, he was raped and something changed. Like he had always been a little strong will and everything. But at that point, it was obstinate. Like he refused to trust Brian and I like, and I don't know if you know about trauma, but, and especially that type of trauma, when boundaries get shattered, it's very hard for that person to trust anyone. And especially a young child, they feel like they've got to take care of themselves. They've got to figure it out themselves because they can't really depend on anyone else. And, um, so it was a really horrible thing, and and we went years, I guess eleven years, without knowing that that had happened. We had suspicions, and had asked him some questions, and he'd always tell us no, you know. Um, but at about sixteen, I, I will just say preteen years, things got really hard, and he began running away and just doing all kind, just being really rebellious. And my husband and I just didn't. We kept saying, God, what? what are we doing? What do we need to do different? Like what's happening? Um, and about at the age of 16, my husband and I just started begging God because we knew we were missing a puzzle piece. We just felt like we were missing something and began to say, God, just send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide us. Let them bring us to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. And there we will glorify you. And so we just began just asking and praying that God would bring life, light to the darkness. And within a few weeks, God revealed what had happened to our son. And um, I would love to say that everything started getting better at that point, but that was not true. (laughs) It got darker. And I really honestly, I don't know if you're familiar with the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel, but that's what I felt like our life was. My, our marriage was a mess with, under all the stress with our son. And then I was dealing from my own trauma of being date raped at 15. I was finally dealing with that. And then our younger son was hiding in his bedroom with his noise counseling headphones on because he just didn't want to listen to the fighting anymore. And so I just felt like our whole family was in shambles. And everything that I had hoped for and dreamt of for my kids, for our marriage, was nowhere to be seen. And I remember, I tell you, so many of you know this, my eloquent prayer was, God, if you don't do something, we're toast. You know, like that was my eloquent prayer. I didn't go much further than that. <laughs> Just... I'm pretty sure I read that in a psalm somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I think it is yeah. in the psalms. <laughs> we'll cover that in the next series. But um it was just so dark. And the Lord, during that time, he gave me the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel, he takes Ezekiel out and it's just bones in this valley. And God begins to breathe upon the bones and they begin to rise up. And then he continues. And then the muscles, the tendons and the ligaments and the sinews and the muscles begin to be placed on the bones and the skin. And then he breathes again and life fills the lungs of that army. And then there's an army. And, and I just felt like during that time and this, he gave me this story as well, the widow of name just, and he was telling me, I still raise the dead though. You're looking at the Valley of dry bones. I will raise this. And he has, he has, and he is, you know, it, we are still seeing the tendons and the ligaments and the muscles put on. It is not finished. It's, the, it's not accomplished. And I don't think any of us will be finished until we see Jesus face to face. But it has been miraculous to see what God is able to do with the broken places in our lives, the broken things in my marriage, in me, in my sons. And God just continues to remind me that he's the redeemer. He redeems the things the enemy means for evil, right? The story of Joseph, when his brothers sell him into slavery, he says, what y'all, you know, what the enemy meant for evil, God turned to good, you know, and I just see that. And I, I just want to encourage you guys 
that God is there with you. Jesus has is entering those places, those valley of dry bones, those dead places. He sees you. He notices you. He is not unaware and he wants to breathe his life into it. But it takes something from us. It takes something from us. Now, Jesus, he is going to do. God is going to do what he's going to do. But we've got to surrender, guys. Like, we got to get off the buyer. We've got to get up. When he says get up, we got to be willing to get up. When he says lay it down, we got to be willing to lay it down. When he says shake that viper off, we got to be willing to shake the viper off, right? We can't hold on to those things. And sometimes that's really hard because some of those things got very comfortable for us, right? Sometimes the the dysfunction we're living in or the pain we're living in, it has just become familiar to us. And to go into something unfamiliar is super scary. But I'm going to tell you guys, the freedom that Jesus has brought me as I've kept laying down and laying down the things in me. He got rid of my religiosity. I had no idea it was there, by the way. I thought <laughs> I thought I was just following Jesus, but he pointed out that it had become this whole religious thing for me. And he he told me, you got to lay that down. And that was scary. That was super scary because it meant really that I couldn't do anything to gain his compassion and love and attention, right? And I had for years tried to spin my wills, gaining some kind of approval from him. And I'm just telling you now, I think just having a time of response, I want to encourage you guys, who is Jesus? And let's just stand if you guys don't mind. Who is Jesus to you? Like, let's, I want you just to take some time in the next week or so just to really reflect and ask the Lord, like, who are you to me? Are you just some great prophet in my mind, a great story, a great man, a great teacher? Or are you truly the one who saves me, the one who speaks into my suffering and says, don't cry, and then tells me to get up? You know, so I want you to ponder and ask the Lord. And I encourage people always to do Psalm 139. I think it's verse 21 that says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's anything inside of me that keeps me from following you. And I would encourage you just to pray that and say, because God knows. He knows those deep beliefs that are there that drive us to, to act and do like we do at times. You know, when we get something kind of hits us and we respond in a way that's not very lovely or loving, you know, like God knows those spots and he wants to bring healing and he wants to bring those up to you, not for condemnation, but for freedom. Can you even imagine if we walked as God's created being the way he created us before this world knocked us down, before the things of life hurt us? Can you imagine the freedom that we would have and the ability to love people and the ability to speak hope to people about him, right? Guys, we, I just want to challenge you to ask him and surrender, surrender the beliefs. And I want to ask you too, if you have never received Jesus, if you've never known the Jesus that we spoke, the Jesus of the Bible, who reached to those that the the society did not value. If you look at all of the stories, almost every single one of them was to people they had pushed outside of society, right? Had said, they're not worthy. They're not valuable. And Jesus would go to them. That was who he, that's why the religious people didn't like him very much because he was making them look bad, you know? So if you've never known that Jesus, it's today's the day. Guys, I I tell people all the time, I have not regretted for one second letting Jesus be Lord and Savior of my life. 
He has not disappointed me. He has saved me. He has saved me from regrets. He has made my life so rich. This will be the best day of your life, best decision you've ever made if you decide today that Jesus is who you want to follow, that he is the one who saves you and he is who he says he is. So let's just pray right now. And Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for never giving up on us, for entering our woundedness, entering our suffering, not being a God, a father who's far off and distant from us because you don't want to deal with a crying child. You're the child, you're the father, just like Jesus showed you and your character in this story, who comes over and tells us, don't cry and has compassion. You're the father that is deeply moved with our sorrow. Your empathy is amazing, God. You are the God who sees us. You are the God who knows us. And Jesus, you're the one who never disappoints. You're the one who always shocks us because your ways are so different from anything we've known in this world. Lord, I pray that you be glorified and you be magnified in each of our lives. If there are people here, Lord, I just pray for each of us who are your your followers, Lord, that we will let you come in, King of Glory, as Psalms, I think that's Psalms 24, come in, King of Glory, Lord, and open the gates so that you can come into our heart, into every part of us, and, and begin to repair and restore what the enemy has taken Lord, I pray for anyone here who has not known you, that God, I just pray that you reveal yourself in a huge way. Let them see you today in this story. And if you're someone who've never received Christ and you think that Jesus doesn't want you because you're a mess, you're not good enough for him, or you need to go clean yourself up before you can come to him, that's from the pit Guys, that's from the enemy. That's from the pit of hell. It has no place here. Jesus loves you right here, right now. Just like this widow did nothing to gain his attention. He comes to you. So with eyes closed, if there's anyone here that wants to receive this Jesus, that you have not experienced this kind of love that God has today, I just ask you to raise your hand. If you'd like to receive Jesus today and know him for who he is, praise you, Lord. See you. Praise you, Lord. Like I said, this is the best decision you'll ever make. No regrets. He will come into every spot and just heal and restore. If you raised your hand and you want to talk to someone, please talk to we can come talk to Kelly or I, or um, if you came with somebody, talk to them. I encourage you. Father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness to us. I just pray, Lord, that we are changed, that we walk out of here knowing you in such a deeper way. And I just pray by us seeing your face, Jesus, we'll adore you more that will be devoted to you more because you're so amazing. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Bless these people. Bless my brothers and sisters. Be glorified and magnified in each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's hear it for the Lord. Amen. Amen. You are not written off. Go walk in the newness of life restored in Christ. Yes. God bless. Amen. Thank you, Siri. Thank you.